we pray together? Father, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You're the ancient of days. You came from eternity past and will reign forever. Forever. Sometimes we think about that like it's an imaginary thing. Like how can that be even possible? But you're here with us right now, even in this moment today. All of our lives intersecting in this room, no matter what we have done, even five minutes before we came in here, or what we'll do after, your thoughts of us are the same forever. And if we are in Christ, we are forever in the favor of you, O holy God. We pray we'd cower in that truth today and humility and in the fear of you. We thank you, Lord. See, could we sing together? It's one of my favorite parts, just singing a cappella, just everybody. We're going to sing Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Ready? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Come on. And the things of Amen. Be seated. Be seated. Thank you, band. Turn to Joel 2. Joel chapter 2. I'll always remember that. I didn't have the guts to do it first semester, but I had to do it before we graduate. You guys get away. Man, you guys sing well. All right. Our world today is all about things, all about materialism, all about themselves and not about God. And for that, the world is destined to burn in hell. We saw that last night in the Super Bowl, at the game, most of us watched it. And everything from commercials to the food we ate to just the the, the culture around it, it's all centered on the consumer, right? It makes so much money. Even human trafficking at that event is so huge. And it's just a spectacle on display of the world's love for themselves. It's a great time. And we have fun through it. I'm not condemning that event. It's not the event that's the problem. It's our hearts. And yesterday I was with uh, our church, actually. We watched the game as a, uh, as a church body. It was a great time. And I found an outlier in conversation among people that otherwise look toward themselves. He's a guy that hosted the party. Him and his wife have a very nice house, have been blessed by God with, with financial um, with, with, with wealth in their houses, uh, they, they steward it well, and it, it, it's very nice, and they use it to, to minister to people, but, but even he, with all his wealth and all the things that he's done, told me by the end that he, in a roundabout way, he struggles with worrying about how he sleeps at night and that there's, there, there, there's trouble unless unless he say, keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He told me he has to say that every night before bed. In the morning, he tells himself that because he has to know that what he is worrying about is not actually real. If we worry about ourselves, and if we think about ourselves, maybe some of us in this room are thinking that way even today. That life isn't worth it that this rat race that is school will just get out with a bachelor's degree and have the same problems that we did coming in. But even he, with all his wealth and whatever he could have in human experience with grandkids, and we can go on and on, he said he has to rely on that verse. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. We need more than what we have, no matter how much we have. 
And how much do we think we have then is actually worthless? Because we're here today, and I've thought that even this semester, that, that why, why keep going? What is there a reason to continue day by day and what we know is hard, what we know we will ultimately fail at in one way or another? But all the same, we live as though it is worth something. Even our... Uh, Winter play, I thought of for a second of explaining the plot, but then I do an injustice of what those guys are doing on stage. Go see that play. It's so good. And I know people who saw that, yes, it's so good. So good. Um, but it's all about the, the, the relationship between man's heart and material things. And how do we deal with that? The point is today, if we trust in anything except Jesus to save us, you actually have nothing and we'll burn in hell, just like the rest of the world, for all of eternity. That's the truth. We're going to look at that through this text of what that means. So we're in Joel chapter 2. Our main idea for today is this. Everyone has sin on their account that requires payment. Everyone has sin on their account that requires payment. But God is supremely gracious and merciful to forgive sin through the person of Jesus Christ. Everyone has sin on their account that requires payment. But God is supremely gracious and merciful to forgive sin through the person of Jesus Christ. So we're in Joel chapter 2. And the prophet Joel is talking to Jerusalem. Begin with me in verse 1. Blow the horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and total darkness. Like the dawn spreading over the mountains, a great and strong people appears such as never existed in ages past and will never come again in all the generations to come. A fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame blazes. The land in front of them is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them it is like a desert wasteland. There is no escape from them. Their appearance is like that of horses, and they gallop like war horses. They bound on the tops of the mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army deployed for war. Nations writhe in horror before them. All faces turn pale. They attack as warriors attack. They scale walls as men of war do. Each goes on his own path, and they do not change their course. They do not push each other. Each proceeds on his own path. They dodge the arrows, never stopping. Stay with me in verse 9. They storm the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like thieves. The earth quakes before them. The sky shakes. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars cease their shining. The Lord makes his voice heard in the presence of his army. His camp is very large. Those who carry out his command are powerful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful. Who can endure it? We see here that there's a kingdom. And follow along in your text today with me. We're going to be in the text a lot. I know it's easy not to pull out your Bibles or uh, to zone out while we're reading. But this is important, what we're we're looking at here. We see that God is completely just towards wrong that is committed against him and his perfect standard as ruler of the world. We see here there's there's an army in the day of the Lord. Is this what you expected of the day of the Lord, by the way? We, We tend to only remember the verses, at least I do, of the times where the day of the Lord is the coming and the uh, where, where we reign one day, right? It's, it's, it's good. But we see here, this is awful. Look at the language is here. A, a fire devours in front of them in verse 3. Nations writhe in horror before them in verse 6. And it says, no one will escape this. This army is not, not like a human army, only in the way they progress and advance, but they, they leave nothing behind. In chapter 1, it talks about the same day as a plague of locusts. That's scary. I don't know if you've seen the pictures of what's going on in Africa right now. I saw it on a, on a website. It was, coincidentally, while I was researching this, and this guy's just running through the street, and there's just these hordes of flying things around him. 
If you've ever read a Stephen King novel or have seen a movie like that, you know how a, a visceral experience that is. And this is the day of the Lord. But yet we don't view it this way. It's too easy to get sanitized to the justice of God because we are sanitized to our sin. Especially to a, in a place like this, this is fantastic. And we hear the word all the time, but where there's more grace and Satan pushes harder and there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on here that we don't even realize because we succumb to the sin that seems so easily acceptable. So look at 2, 1 and 2. Even this is underblown compared to what had happened in the text before this. So 2, 1, let's read it again. It says, Blow the horn in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, let all residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. And then here, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness. Like the dawn spreading over the mountains, a great and strong people appears, such as never existed in ages past and will never again in all generations to come. Turn with me real quick. Keep your hand there. Turn to Genesis 19. Remember the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? Often we forget that in, in the beginning, we're not going to read that, but Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah because it was a favorable land. It looked like it had God's blessing, right? It was a profitable city. The land was better. But we all know they did not follow the Lord. In fact, they were very carnal. And they openly rebelled against God and were, followed their own way. So we're in Genesis 19, look at verse 20, 28. Genesis 19, verse 28. Let's start at verse 27. Earlier in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. In verse 28, he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, and he saw that smoke was going up from the land like smoke of a furnace. So it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval. And the story goes on from there. But focus on, that, on that, that, that language that says that smoke came up from it. You get the sense of dread. This is exactly the language that it's talking about in Joel chapter 2 in this passage that we're reading. Which implies two things. For one, the destruction of the Lord is sure. And for two, our sin is as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it doesn't list here what the offense is anywhere in Joel. It doesn't say this is what the problem was and now God's going to judge them for it as though the amount of sin issues the amount of, of judgment. No, no. We are guilty before God just like Sodom and Gomorrah was. It's more intense than we once thought. The sin that's being judged, it's, it's not specified but it denotes a certain idolatry of the people here that they were building up a kingdom for themselves and that they were going their own way. And then the army of the Lord comes over the horizon in verse two, and that's, that's scary. Can you picture that? You're standing in a field and, and everything's okay, and then you see, think like Lord of the Rings style or something, you see this people coming and you know what's about to happen. But yet it's implied here in this passage that the people try to defend themselves. It says uh, in, in, uh, in verse 9, for instance, in chapter 2, they storm the city, they run on the wall, they climb to the houses, they enter into the windows like thieves. These people aren't surrendering willingly. The day of the Lord shows us that we are extremely tone deaf to God's glory, to what's really important. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, we have a different standard of glory than God that revolves around ourselves. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it, since it is evaluated spiritually. So therefore, we are against God without any outside help. <laughs> We're not there yet. Without any outside help. As we are born, we are against God because we are towards ourselves. And if we are towards ourselves, then we build up that kingdom that revolves around ourselves. And that kingdom is automatically against the glory of God because it is not for it. We see that even in the teaching of some in the church today. That it is against God. 
We're going to go into a world today where not all churches preach Jesus. People can teach that there is no hell or that hell is not eternal and get widely accepted and embraced by a large number of, uh, number of people in the church today, and they are destined for hell, just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if we are, if we don't do, if we don't do what the text is about to talking about, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But we don't realize, even if we have Christ, and let's just jump there, and we don't, are not in awe of our salvation, that's what we are being saved from. And I'm preaching at myself just as much as I'm preaching to you all today. We make it about ourselves so much. And we have a sin debt that needs to be paid or else it will be avenged. It will be avenged. Romans 3, 10 through 17. We don't have to turn there. I've got to start moving faster. But Romans 3... 10 through 17 says this, and this is just Paul citing a vast number of Old Testament scriptures. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. Did you hear that? There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In the verse before that, in verse 9, it says, For Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. This excludes no one. Not to belabor the point, but I don't think we can belabor the point. Is that we are so guilty against God, not even... Well, of course, in compared to his glory, but in comparison to that and what he has established as good, I mean, if we were free to go about ourselves, then I, I, we wouldn't have to be here at Cedarville. We wouldn't be here. But God is glorious. And that, 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 that glory requires a unanimous support for that because it is just that sovereign, just that good. So we continue on. My second point is God is merciful to his enemies. God is supremely merciful to his enemies. Let's get back in the text here. Let's read uh, 12 and 13. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Even now, even in your sin, and the day of the Lord is impending, just as it was in Joel, even more so today, says we are in the last day, you can turn to God in the 11th hour. Let's notice in verse 12, stay with me here, it doesn't matter how big the rival kingdom is. It just says, turn to me with all your heart. This is the Lord's declaration. It would have said, since you are something, it doesn't give a qualifier, does that make sense? It doesn't say anywhere in this, in in Joel, how much sin there was, or how big the kingdom was, how much, how big the sin was. It just says, turn to the Lord with all your heart. And really, in saying all your heart, it's, it's assumed it all comes down to an encounter with God himself. An encounter with God himself is that if you know that there's a God, but he is not coming, he has not revealed himself to you, let alone in this way, we'll get to that in a second, but if you've not seen him, then you do not know him. That's what it says in the following verse. So, It is merciful to first even come and threaten this impending doom. And we'll talk about later. He's not just threatening. God will not be mocked. But in revealing himself to us, it pierces the heart. So it says here, verse 13, tear your hearts, not just your clothes. The true way to tell if your encounter with God is true is whether 
you can possibly go on in life without surrendering to him, right? This isn't a, 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 a about seeing, weighing pros and cons of God versus ourselves, even though we do that every day. If we come in contact with the Lord God, we will worship. He demands worship. He says at the end, at, at the the feet of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's not up for debate. So if we have these hard, torn hearts, it just means we haven't seen Jesus. And we have seen Jesus. It's like the Pharisees did in the Gospels where they, they knew about God, but they did not see God. You get what I'm saying here? And that, 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 that follows as it says here in verse 13. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. And the easiest way to fake it is to tear your clothes and either not tear your hearts or expect to tear your hearts later. It's easy to repent with a very earthly mindset like, okay, I'll do this, 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 and this. Maybe even especially at a place like this where, where we... we, we in, in, in such a place where the gospel is glorified, then the, the natural sinful response is to act like we're following that, right? So it's not because of what Cedarville is doing, it's because of our hearts that we're like this and that we, that we love ourselves more than we love the things of God. And I don't know how we do that. that, that I, know, I think you, you know in your own hearts, I know in my heart how we do that, how we how we say, okay, I'll do better next time, or I will not say get better and then go to God like straight up, but you know, like in effect, that's what you're doing. And that is just a different way of saying, I can save myself before coming to God. That's all that you're doing. That's all that I do. Every time that we, we, we say that our worth is in something other than Christ, other than what he did, nothing that we did. So let's continue in uh, 2.14. It says, who knows? Well, well, let's go back to verse 13 a little bit. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Now, real quick, some of you only see God for what was before that as God who's going to come and destroy. And if you don't turn to him and you don't give him all you got, like right now, he's going to tear you up. But that's not the character of God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and so on. He relents from sending disaster. This is not the character of God. It's not unjust of God to come and attack because just as his nature is one of grace, it's one of his glory. And he gets the most glory, as we'll see in the following text, by giving grace. But I get ahead of myself again. Verse 14. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. First of all, what happened here? Like what? Just, just a few verses ago, are you guys tracking with me here? Just a few verses ago, he was saying, you're about to be destroyed. The army of the Lord is coming through the houses and destroying everything. This is not just like, all right, you better surrender. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill you. you know, it's, we're not playing here. This is God and he's coming to destroy those who are rebelling against him. And now he says, he reveals his character. He says, who knows, he might turn and relent against a guilty people and leave a blessing behind him. And not only to be set free, but there to be left a blessing the sea in here in verse 14 and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. So this denotes, as we saw earlier in the passage, and it shows a restoration of the land that God was going to destroy. You see, God never just is neutral when he appears. It is neither either complete wrath against those who are rebelling against him, but when he blesses, it is like none other. That is the nature of God. And it says earlier... The, before, it was like the Garden of Eden. That's what it would be restored to. It's not just like, you'll get your plants again, you'll be fine. This is a restoration of Garden of Eden-like terms. It's a huge blessing of a guilty people. 
Once again, God's under no obligation to repent. The language here is similar to the language of Jonah, where, where uh, yeah, he said he, he, he's not, he doesn't have to repent against the Ninevite people, right? It's not like we can control God by saying, all right, uh, I, I repent now, you give me what I, what I, it's not a business relationship. And we can't fake our way to God's favor. But so, so, so we have this here, and the, the, the character of God is made known by Joel. And the impending judgment is shown by Joel. And how will the people respond? Read in verses 15 through 17. Blow the horn in Zion. Announce a sacred feast. Proclaim an assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the infants. Even babies nursing at the breast. Let the groom leave his bedroom and her bride, the bride her bed, honeymoon chamber. Let the priest, the Lord's ministers, weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, have pity on your people, Lord. Notice here, this, this is indicative of a good church later on, and I didn't even write this down. No, it's not an individual repentance. It's not say, each one go to God and repent in your heart. This is the group of people who are repenting together and following Christ together. This is a mark of what the, a, a body does when it's following God. But the point here is God's supreme glory is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. God's supreme glory is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Where'd the justice go? Is God not just to let these people go who he was about to completely light up? You, you read verse, chapter two. This is a horror movie. This is not sanitized. Go to Isaiah real quick. Isaiah 53, three through five. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. I'm going to take a drink. All right. Still heard pages turning. All right, here we go. Isaiah 53, 3, 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. He was treated like we treat God, right? Verse four, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains and we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. Oh, may you see the glory of God in this text today in Joel that we are in. This is the ultimate, the ultimate turn of events for us and the people of Joel too, is that the promise was coming and God said he, he, he passed over future sins on account of what this prophecy was saying. That God, seeing the sin of man, is right to punish him and to raid their houses and to do whatever he would want. He's just to do that because of his glory. And we have rebelled against him. But he was pierced for our transgression. And what does it say here? It's just like it says in our text. He was regarded, struck down by God and afflicted. God himself poured out his wrath on Christ. Go back to Joel with me real quick. And we're going to finish this. Early, uh, l later on in the chapter. Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 28. If you notice this verse, pretty famous as being cited as the beginning of the first sermon in church history. At Pentecost, when Peter says, when everyone's saying they're drunk, these people are crazy. Peter says this, this is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel. Let's read here. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. 
Then your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves in those days. I will display wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Excuse me. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Among the survivors, the Lord calls. We deserved God's destruction. And I hope you get at least a sense of that by God's word today. We deserved what these people in this text were going to deserve. Exactly, if not more so, than what the text could describe. But all of that was put on Jesus Christ, a singular person. All that wrath, even the attitude of God to be like, well, like we are, just kind of half-heartedly, I don't really like you, but I'm going to give you salvation. None of that. God's complete blessing is poured out upon us if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is huge. So we go back to the what happened, right? And let's just do this over again. The what happened that the people, all of a sudden, that God's character, even though his glory was revealed and the people rebelled against him at first, they said, if you follow, if, 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 if you believe now for us on the Lord Jesus Christ you shall be saved. And then they, they, they did, they repented and God was merciful even though he didn't have to be. He doesn't have to be and that's what he promises us. So you might be here today and you're, you're, you're thinking God can not possibly use me and even here today not really listening to me, not really listening to God's word preached, it doesn't matter if you listen to me, but and you're completely dead to this. God wants to take you and say, I don't, I don't just want your good things. Like he said to the woman at the well, I want you, but bring your five husbands. Or, or bring your husband. And she said, no, I, I have, you, you've had five. And he wants to take the worst part of you and use it as a trophy of what he can forgive and what he can make new again. This is for you today, even if you feel like you cannot possibly be a Christian. There's nothing you can gain in yourself, but you always have everything in the person of Jesus Christ. Believe on him today. Even if you have accepted him, pray that prayer. This is new and fresh. His mercies are new every morning. So let's take that today. Let's, let's pray. Father, you are supremely merciful and your character is good. You are good and you are glorious. And before we couldn't see your glory, we, we regarded it as, as nothing. Like Jesus was, Isaiah 53. We, we don't see that because we're blind to the, the really true, the, the things that are really true. We see the world for ourselves. So Protect us to those who are in Christ today. Protect us from going back to that. Please, Lord, protect us from that, from thinking that we could um, pull one over on you with sin or do things on our own terms in any way. But may we sit and stand in awe of your work on the cross. And today to those who are far from you, we pray we'd be, they'd be heaped in with us and just a big amount of grace. We will decide to follow Jesus because that's the only way to life. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done, what you're gonna do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.